and uh, on, yeah, on this beautiful, finally, spring day. Yay. Yeah. And how many people went with your special glasses to watch the eclipse of the sun? And how many of you sang during that, a total eclipse of the heart? Yeah. That's all I could think of all day long. That was that, was that ear, ear bug, whatever, in my head. Um, okay, so um, we, we are, are going to do chapter 12 today. We are moving into a, the final major section of, um, of the, the letter to the Romans. And for those of you who have found uh, the theology and the doctrinal... Um, conversation a bit of a challenge, even if you didn't find it a bit of a challenge, uh, w that what we're going, we're moving to now is a more practical conversation. Um, St. Saint, Saint Paul, being the excellent teacher that he is, and because he emulates my thinking, <laughs> uh, my way of thinking, that th that the it is all well and good to understand our faith, but if we do not know how to put it into practice, then what's, what good is it? You know, we become like the Pharisees and the Sadducees where it's, a, it's, a, it's about the peripheral um, parts of our faith and not, not the, tr the true nature of God and what God is calling us to become. Um, so this is going to be a much more practical uh, and, and so this is why I say that my hope is, is that we will be done the second week of May because we, after, um, there are uh, 16 total chapters, so that gives us four more weeks or four more chapters. But I also know that we could get into some potentially very good conversations, and I want to honor that. So we're just, I know we have to be done by the second week of, of June, because we can't be here after that. Um, okay, so um, unless there is any, any questions, comments, concerns about what we have studied up to this point, then we will, um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, as I was saying, you know, chapter 12, verse 1, to chapter 15, verse 13, where it's all about um, how to live the gospel, how to, uh, you know, living a life of faith, um, okay? So let us pray, and let us begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and ye will renew the face of the earth. O God, Holy, Holy Spirit, did in heart those of faithful, grant Spirit, help us to us what is right, and always rejoice in your consolations. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, and it, you know, what often happens too is that, that the Holy Spirit in the moment of prayer speaks to me, um, and uh, Roger and I were talking earlier about the whole idea of inviting more people to the study. And a lot of times, I don't know if you've had this experience, well, I'm just going to feel so stupid. I know nothing. And, you know, this summer, if, if, we, in, if we indeed do this study this summer, um, then this would be a good study to bring people to, to, to realize that, um, uh, that they're not as stupid as they think they are, but more importantly, that... that a Bible study is user user friendly because it'll be mostly about the stories of these people's lives and how how they um, fed into the story of salvation. You know, so um, this would this would be a good time to um, to invite people to. Okay. So that being said, we are looking at. Um, so this first section, we're only going to do chapter 12. We'll end it next week when we do chapter 13. But what we're going to be doing today is that we're going to, we're, that the story of salvation. So we have studied the story of salvation. We have studied how 
Jesus Christ and um, uh, gave uh, transformed um, our our transformed life. And so now that that we have looked at this the the truth of of this this great mystery and this great gift, we are now going to look at how that story is meant to transform us. That we, it's not enough that we know this, but, but we need to start living this. And then the question becomes, well, how do I do that? And we do that by transforming our own lives. And before anybody gets um, overwhelmed or feels discouraged, like, ah, I've got all this homework to do, um, realize that it's one step at a time. You know, just one step at a time. If, if in walking out of today's study or the next few weeks' study, you say to yourself, this is one thing I know I can do. You know, I can, I can, I can be more positive. Um, I can be more loving. Um, whatever. Uh, that, then we, this study will have done its job. Every week, one, one thing. So with that, we are looking at... Um, the first two verses, this is, see, this is why it's going to, yeah, we got to take one chapter at a time. We're doing two verses at a time. No, we're not the whole way, but. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and pleasing and perfect. Okay, comments, questions, concerns. Already a lot more understandable, huh? Right? Okay. Um, no, no comments. No, nothing. Um, the whole thing. The whole thing. It has a lot of power in two verses. This is this is why. Um, yeah, we could spend probably a whole study just t discussing these two verses, um, and and the application to our lives. But this is why. Uh, I always thought that, that people who had a PhD knew a lot about everything. When I realized that, that we, you know, education is a pyramid, and the higher you go, the less you focus in on. You know, it's, it's you know, grade school, we've got to be exposed to everything. High school, we're exposed to everything. Undergraduate, especially if you're a liberal arts college, everything. But then you get to, ma to your master's work, and now you're, you're starting to focus in. When you get to a PhD in, in scripture, you're basically looking at one or two verses as your thesis statement. So, and now you can see why. We could spend a whole lifetime just studying this. Um, so, uh, and we're going to, then let's move into this. Um, the first, in the first verse where it says, I, so St. Paul is making a transition. He, and when he says, I appeal to you, therefore, and we've talked about how therefore can be a tr transitional comment. Um, now that you know all this stuff about salvation history, therefore, by the mercies of God, you know, he's, this is a prayer to him, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So when, when, and, you know, this, uh, this scholarship, yes, we could think of bodies as being a um, figurative comment, you know, um, our bodies, which meaning our souls. And does anybody have souls in there, in, in, in verse 1 where it says, present your souls as a living sacrifice? The, the point being there is that St. Paul is not only talking about the transformation. I've got to move this because I can't see your beautiful face. Okay. Um, transform, you know, now that we've had this story of salvation, it's not just about transforming our, our minds and our hearts, but it is about transforming every part of our being. So when St. Paul is speaking here of bodies, 
he is talking about um, our physical bodies as well. And I had to go to confession <laughs> after studying this because I haven't done such a good job with my, and, and it, 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 if in looking at other passages in scripture written by St. Paul, there, the passage of, you know, your bodies are a temple, a living temple. <clears throat> and why would he be so focused on bodies? It's because it is through our bodies that we communicate to the world our belief systems, right? You know, it's our hands and our feet, you know, our hands that, that care nurturing, nurturingly to others. It is our, 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 our feet that carry us to the poor. Um, it, is, is, it is our smile that communicates to others that we're glad that they're around, right? So... Um, so the, I, you don't separate um, the physical from the spiritual. They, they are intertwined. We cannot separate them. All right? Um, and then he goes on to say, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? And I'm turning to you. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Yeah, I was going to say, don't all talk at once. And then you all talked at once. <laughs> Go ahead. Your whole life should be, every part of your life should be a sacrifice. Okay. So every part of us, but what are we sacrificing? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of cheating because I have put <laughs> Cheater, cheater. No. Right. Yeah. Paul, did you, do you want to add to that? I was going to say, uh, offer up the, not only our, our joys and, and our happiness, but our pain and sorrow. Yeah. And our failing. Yeah. We, we, uh, we do a lot of that. Yes. We do a lot of failing. Well, I know I do a lot of failing. It, it's the, it is the, the our, so, uh, you know, um, um, you know, to present or offer your bodies as a living sacrifice means exactly that. It is, is recognizing that, that um, so okay, let me take a step back. In the time, in the time of Christ and, and for, for millennia before that and up until, the, to, until 70 A.D. And, and 70 A.D. was when, um, the, when Jerusalem was invaded by the Romans. There was a, a revolt, and by the um, the the Jews, they and they basically were entrapped in Jerusalem itself, and starved out. And then finally, Rome came in, um, and as a show of strength, um, a, a, a little Bible trivia. Um, the Ro I can't think of the name of the general that rode in, but he rode in on a, ver an, on a war stallion. And what does that mean? I come to conquer you. I come to, um, to oppress you. I come to... So he rode in on, on a stallion and, and destroyed much of the city, but destroyed the temple. And from that point on, there was... Um, that's the Wailing Wall. That's what is left of the temple, is the Wailing Wall. Up to that point, what type of sacrifice was offered in the temple? It was a dead animal. Yeah, it was a dead animal. The first living sacrifice that was honored by God was who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Exactly. So in our emulating um, our Lord, no, we're not, all, we're not meant to go to the cross, um, literally. Although there are those in faith who have been called to martyrdom. Please do not let that be my call. The, but the, um, for, the, for the rest of us, the idea that it's not enough to, um, to throw, you know, what is a sacrifice today for a lot of people is throw money in the, in the, in the plate, collection plate. What God wants is our lives. What God wants is, is who we become. 
What God wants is to, to have us, to embrace us completely. And the only way that happens if we become more and more Christ-like. Like. And so the living sacrifice that we offer is, is, is changing, transforming our attitudes from the, the Eeyore to the Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> Yes, I was told this morning I need a new spirit animal. <laughs> you know, uh, it, is, it's, it is transforming um, the, uh, the way we do things in terms of, of uh, uh, the food, we, you know, giving up the, the bad food and eating the good food. It is giving up um, the, the lack of, of exercise and exercising. It is giving up um, uh, the comforts that we surround ourselves with so that we might generously give to the people around us. And so as we go into chapter 12, what, what St. Paul is going to do is he's going to explain what does it mean to be a living sacrifice. Make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, it, in our, our Christian living, um, let's see, let me, um, so Christian living is meant to be a physical action. You know, it is meant to be, um, transformative, not only internally, but externally. Um, you know, Christian, and a part of that, that external action is worship. So when your, your friends and, and family tell you, well, they don't need to go to church. Yes, they need to go to church. Why? Because we need to physically give praise to God. We need to physically transport ourselves out of the culture of the world and physically transport ourselves into the culture of our God. Um, and then, then as, uh, for us as Catholics, it is the kneeling, it is the bowing, it is the making the sign of the cross, it is the walking forward to receive Christ. Um, it, it, these are all physical actions. Uh, and, and as a little caveat, if you're finding it hard to pray, you know, to put yourself in a position of prayer, move. You know, and two, two, two options is pick your butt up from wherever you are and go and sit someplace else, meaning create a different prayer place. Um, where I, you know, I have found in my own life that, that I go through a period where I'm praying fervently and I'm having no problems praying. Then all of a sudden it becomes tedious and boring and, and, and I find myself short-circuiting what I'm doing. I have to physically get myself to a different place to pray, you know. Um, and, and, and that's just me. I'm, I'm a bit ADD in, in, in some ways. The other way, too, is walk, you know, walk someplace. Um, you know, you can pray the rosary while you're walking. You, you can listen to, to scripture while you're walking. Um, there, so it, it, it is the idea that, that there is nothing wrong with physical action as we're praying, okay? Um, and then Christian living is communal in nature. Meaning, we physically need to be around one another. And I think the study um, confirms that, that. That just the conversation that I heard going on as everybody is making their name tags, you know, um, we, you know, getting to know each other. And, and um, one of the things that, that, that I love I often don't participate in it because I'm usually taking my neighbor um, to, uh, to mass and she's 92 years old and she wants to get home because her physical activity is going from the bed to the couch and then, you know, li very limited in her movement. Um, but I love walking out of church and having all these groups of people chattering away with one another, you know. Um, the, the conversations, although... Sometimes I wish the ushers would realize that when they leave those doors open, it doesn't allow people in church to pray because everybody is talking so loud outside. But we're meant to be physically around each other. 
Um, and again, this is why I give praise for the fact that I'm Catholic, because as a Catholic, we are obligated to come to church. And we have physical activity in our sacramental worship. Um, you know, it is it, that we are, con that we, we embrace this idea of, of, our, of our faith being more than just studying. Um, you know, you say priests that were obligated to go. I don't know. I'm sure a lot of people in here, all you probably feel this way. I go to church for the reasons you just mentioned. Yeah. You know, I love going there. It's a, it's a good time. I would actually look forward to going to church. Yeah. You know, there's just so many benefits to it. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it, the and, and if you uh, so if you sit, how many of you, how many of us sit in the same place every time we go to mass? Okay. That's yeah. As long and that's fine. That's absolutely fine as long as you don't get mad at someone who is who, who got there first and sitting in your spot. Um, the 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 um, but it's funny how how you'll notice the people around. If no, let me say it this way. We should notice the people around us, you know, and so that if they're not there. The next week you go, oh, I missed you. Where were you? <laughs> so they know that they were missed, right. you know? Yes, Paul. I, I was say, there's another aspect of this, and that is we, uh, the company we keep is the company we act like. So yes. So you're not on Saturday night, if you're out with drug dealers and getting high. <laughs> that, which is exactly what I would do. I would be out with drug dealers <laughs> and... <laughs> But no, you, you, make, you make a very important point. Let's all dance for a moment. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, uh, that, uh, you make a very important point. point. When, so uh, a part of my, my career, I was involved in high school youth ministry. And um, back in the day when for the Catholic Church, we were making that transition from um, the only thing offered to junior high and high school students was CYO, which is basically all sports, to actually having, um, uh, embracing the model that the Protestant church had, had, had adopted years ago, which was a much more social-based um, interaction. And when I, I, my job was to go around to Catholic churches to convince them that this is the model that they wanted to now adopt. And what I would say to parents is, we all know what, what negative peer pressure is, don't we? Mm -hmm. Well, there is such a thing as positive peer pressure. You should want opportunities for your students to be surrounded by other kids doing the right thing. And that's exactly what, what church is, that we, we hope, you know, we're, we, we, in, we, um, you know, we want to live in an environment we want to participate in an environment that is going to support this transformation that we're trying to make in our own lives. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any other? Well, I, I had a question about the Romans when they invaded in 70. But weren't the Romans there when Jesus was Oh, absolutely. So they just let things go till? Okay, I'm going to come back to you, Maureen, because I think John wants to say, wants to make a comment in terms of what we're talking about, but I will, I will address that. Yeah, I would say, to me, the Mass has a communal aspect yes. to it. And the Mass has a communal aspect. That, that I try to, uh, we don't say the Confidior every, every, every time, you know, but it's like, I confess to God and to you, my brothers and sisters, and I really sort of will look around, around look around. And, you know, That's a good point. It will.
Yeah. John, uh, I'd like to say you're speaking the language of this audience because if you mention confetti or to uh, 16, 17, 18 year olds, they wouldn't know yeah. what you were talking about. <laughs> Yeah. Well, but no, no, the, the, the sad part is I think that the, you're, you're absolutely right. This is the audience for our, to say the word confidior, but I think if you were to say that at church, most of the people go, confidior, what? Yeah. But, but no, it, but you make, you, you make a very p valid and important point. I love the idea, and I'm going to start doing that, that when we get to that point, you know, I confess to you, my brothers and sisters, to look around and, re you know, to recognize the fact that, that we're, we're in the same boat. We're, we're, we're trying to transform our lives, but we're here because we recognize that we're sinners and we need God. And, 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 but it, everything about the Mass is communal. Why do you think we say everything with one voice? Because it's a com the communal nature of Mass. You know, why do we all sit at the same time? Why do we all stand at the same time? And, and St. Paul's going to, we're going to talk about the body of Christ um, later on. But that, 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 that idea, it's a, yeah. So getting back to Maureen's question. Um, so yes, the Romans had occupied... Um, I want to say in 60 AD, uh, BC, some they had become the occupiers of of the uh, of the Middle East, of Jerusalem, and and that uh, and that whole area. Um, but what happened was, and as we when we talk about um, like Simon the Zealot, or we talk about Judas as trying to push Christ into action. Um, that there was a very strong belief within the Jewish community um, that, for some anyway, that they had to make the Messiah show himself. And the way to do that was to bring about a rebellion. So that's why there was a constant issue of insurrection of the Jews against the Romans and why um, Herod was put into his position as the king of the Jews um, because so that he would suppress these this insurrection and why not all of the temple leadership but a lot of the temple leadership didn't like Jesus because they felt not that he was the Messiah but that he was going to bring about the fall of, of, uh, of their their faith because he was going to bring about an insurrection and that would bring Rome in, into the picture in a harsher and harder way. So what happened in, 80, uh, excuse me, in 70 AD was that there was a group that brought about such a rebellion. And, um, and in that insurrection, what Rome did was it literally circled Jerusalem and, and cut, it so, cut it off from the rest of the world and starved them out, literally. Um, and, huh? Don't you find that kind of going on right now with the children starving over there, you know, and... It is something that's been, been repeated throughout history. It, it's, this, is not, this was not the first time something like that happened, nor was it the last time something like this will happen. Um, but so that, that's what happened in 70 AD was when when um, Jerusalem finally fell and Rome was able to, to occupy the city, they destroyed, they, as, a, as an act of vengeance, they destroyed much of the city, but because, knowing that it was the Jews who were, who caught, were, were the, the, um, the main um, problem, they destroyed their temple. So. Right. And they almost became uh, a free nation again. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, the history, um, I know, uh, the history of, uh, of the Jews, the Israelites, um, which is our salvation, our salvation history is fascinating. But it, it, there's nothing new under the sun, you know, basically nothing new under the sun. Okay, we're going to move on. Because uh, we're only on verse 1 and we're already halfway or a third into our, our study. Um, so it... Uh, um, da -da -da -da. 
Okay, um, you know, so verse two, um, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewal of your mind. Basically, St. Paul is making his thesis statement here. Um, you know, renew your mind, um, prove that you may prove what is the will of God. And who are, who are we trying to prove the will of God to? Not meaning that, that we're trying to uh, push our beliefs on others, but we're trying to show to the world that God is present in the world and, God, and who God is, which is love and mercy and kindness. Um, uh, okay, what is good, acceptable, and perfect? All right. Um, so, actually, um, so it's, it is what, what we are called, <coughs> what St. Paul is calling us to is a balance of our interior attitude and our exterior practices. Um, and we've talked about positive and negative uh, peer pressure. Um, essentially what we're, we're what we are trying to do is to, tra to to transform ourselves to become like Christ we will never become God we will never become Christ but our journey is to become more and more to conform ourselves more and more to be like Christ um, and we we do all this for one main reason um, so we will know the will of God that is, you know, do be, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And we do this to know the will of God. Uh, you know, the, and and I, I, I know that in my own life this has been true. I suspect that in your lives as well. The more we, I study scripture, the more I study my faith, the more that I invest myself in, in my um, personal relationship with God, the more I have a sense, it, it, it's not a, a lot of times it's not a question for me, what is the right thing to do? I just know that, you know, given a choice, this is, this is what God's will would, should be and could be. That makes sure, make sense? Okay. All right. Um, last comments before we move on to, yeah, yes, Paul. Okay. And he's constantly saying to, throughout this, Bible study is not a transfer of information. It's supposed to be a transformation. So that reminded me when, when St. Paul used that word, be transformed. Uh, I'm, let me repeat that because I want to remember that. <clears throat> that uh, uh, the study of the Bible, and I would, I would include the study of our faith, is not meant to be a transfer of information but a transformation. That's, 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 that's very powerful. That may be, I have to get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got lazy there. I haven't been, been looking for new t-shirts. Although I have been tempted, I saw one recently that I've been tempted, you know, God loves everyone, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> what? That, if everybody wore that, wouldn't that be perfect? Yeah. Maybe that'll be our group t-shirt. Yeah. Our motto. Our motto, yes. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to move on to verses three. There go those Catholics. Yeah, there goes those Catholics again. <laughs> that is true. Okay, so let, let us uh, uh, turn to verses three th through eight. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than one ought to think, but to think soberly, each according to the measure of faith that God has apportioned. For as in one body we have many parts, and all the parts do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually parts of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them. If prophecy, in proportion to the faith. If ministry, in ministering. If one is a teacher, in teaching. If one exhorts, in exhortation. If one contributes, in generosity. If one is over others, with diligence. 
if one does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Okay. Uh, comments, questions? If you love this? Because? Just everything. It's just, we are, it's not all about us. It's all about we. It's, um, it's, some, not everyone can, can read. Not everyone can sing. Not everyone can preach. Um, it's just that we all really need each other. And it's, and our gifts are given to us. Um, scripture backs it up. You know, we need to use our gifts. Yeah. You know, I always think of your your stories of your your parables of you know the one guy that buried his money and the other one used it and just let it grow. And um, I, I've just pondered over this, and um, it's just you know we are truly one body. Um, many, many years ago, um, I, did a, I did a series on um, the themes of St. Paul, the, you know, taking all of St. Paul's. So I may repeat that one day. Um, one of his major themes is this idea of the body of Christ. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, if you want to reflect more on, on this idea, uh, the idea that... that um, while we are called as individuals and, and in the Catholic Church in, uh, and in, 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 a, in certain sacraments like um, baptism, confirmation, um, matrimony, it is very important that the individual's names are said. And, you know, it's not like I baptize you baby unless that's the name, you know. <laughs> And I, I'm sure there's somewhere in the world that's somebody's name, baby. Um, <clears throat> that it, it, it is, I baptize you, and, with, and then the name of the child. Um, uh, you know, the idea of our being called is very individual, personal, intimate. But we are called into community to be, be for one another. Why? Because we all are given, we, uh, we are given Get, all of us are given gifts, but they're very individual. So that we can, and for St. Paul, what I have been given is not given to me to fortify me, to make me good, to make me. It is given to me, yes, for those reasons, but more importantly, to fortify you, to, to help you, to, to, to help the church be church. Um, you know, um, I have a friend, uh, love her dearly. She cannot carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> but if you sit next to her, you become very aware that she cannot <laughs> carry a tune in a bucket. Because she, God gave me this voice, I'm going to use it. Will she ever sing a solo at, in the choir? Absolutely not. But that's why we have the beautiful voices that we have in our choir. You know, um, you know uh, the... Uh, the, 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 the frustrating part, for me anyway, is that so many people, you, using Ellen's um, image of Jesus' parable, way too many people bury. Maybe that might be a good summer study, too, is to look at the parables. Um, but, yeah, is, uh, you know, is they bury him. And, and because, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not good enough to sing. Um, oh, you know, n nobody wants to hear me read. Uh, oh, I could never do that. I would be so afraid. Mm -hmm. and, and we are much the lesser as a community because of that. Yeah, um, yeah I, always, I don't like going to 12 o'clock Mass. You know why? Because I almost always have to uh, uh, be a Eucharistic minister. And walking, you know, it just, it, it, I'm... I'm in pain, so it's, this is not something I... And I know that there are people out there that can be a Eucharistic minister. Oh, but I could never do that. But St. Paul is saying, you've been given this gift, and it's not yours. It is the community's, and use it. Um, any other 
Yes, ma'am. Right. So whatever you have, whatever your particular thing is, do the best at it. Exactly. And, and you're going to be giving it out to other people. Not, not everybody can sing. Not everybody can, not everybody can even be at church, you know, because of their, their physical limitations. But everybody can be a prayer warrior, you know. Um, take the bulletin. And, and, you know, read the names of those who are on the sick list. Um, one of the things that I never was able to get going here at St. Colette's, but I did at St. Theodore's when it was St. Theodore's, that was such an excellent ministry was I had people um, outside of the family praying for the children in our religious education program. You know, and so these, the, this, this couple, adopted their you know this classroom and we sent them the picture and and the first names of all the kids and we told the kids the name of their prayer warriors and and we had this dialogue going on you know so every, there is something all of us can do the question is are we willing to listen to the will of god for our lives and that's the challenge okay um yeah. Okay. Um, so it, just kind of moving through um, in verse three, um, you know, by the grace given to me, I say, so when, when, when St. Paul is talking about the grace given to me, he's talking about his call. He's talking about that, that um, he was personally touched by Jesus Christ. So, by, by, my, by my authority, I say to all of you, um, do not think of yourselves uh, more highly than you ought. And, and so he's talking about one of the qualities of living a life of faith is humility. Now, a lot of you sometimes get mad at me when you come up and give me a compliment. And, and I appreciate hearing that I'm you know, I'm doing the right thing. But oftentimes, I don't know how to handle that. I've talked about this before. Because I want to hold on to as much humility as I can because I've worked with and been around way too many people who think they are the next best thing to slice bread. <laughs> um, because, and I know a part of that is because they are already been put on pedestals for because of position or power or whatever, and they begin to believe that it is them. It is, I know what I am capable of, and I'm not capable of this. It is the Holy Spirit that is working through me and, and inspiring me and calling me and helping me. Humility is an essential essential element of, of what it means to be a person of faith, of recognizing that I am here because God has called me to be here. It is a gift of God that I am here. And I am so grateful that God honors me with that gift. And more you, Lord, and less me. Um, and then he goes on to say, but I think, but think of yourselves with sober judgment. Again, it's that idea of, um, for every compliment I get, what pops into my head, and I pray that this always happens because it keeps me grounded, is all of my failures. I tell people all the time, if you saw the very first time in, in my ministry that I had to do public speaking compared to where I am now, you would not, you would go, oh, she's pathetic. <laughs> Uh, it was, I was, I had just gotten this job in youth ministry. I was asked to speak in front of a group of people about the importance of high school youth ministry. It was meant to be a 15 minute presentation. I think I talked for two minutes and, and the priest who hired me told me later he regretted it in that moment that he had hired me. That's how bad I was. So, you know, it, it, sober judgment does not mean to beat ourselves on the back for how bad we are. 
Sober judgment just recognizes that the, the truth of what's going on here, that, that I have been formed, I've been transformed to this place now 45 years later. To, be, to, to have a, a fuller sense of scripture and a fuller sense of comfort and to be surrounded by people that I know kind of like me. You know, it's a safe environment for me. Um, you know, it, 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 so it, it, it's that sober judgment is, a, again, going back to that balance of recognizing, yes, I have, I have a gift for this, but that gift has been nurtured by God and been given by God. And I pray that I continue to honor that gift without ego, with my own personal ego in interfering. And then he goes on to say, um, according to the measure of faith God has given you. Um, and the idea um, is that it's not that some people have been given more faith than others. It's the idea that, that, that we've all been given faith. And, and, and so we base our our life's journey, not in the power that we're receiving because I'm in this position. You must all honor me. You must all think me wonderful. You must, yes, I am the all-knowing <laughs> Teresa, you know. <laughs> Maybe I, my spirit animal should be, I don't know, I'll have to think about that. Uh, but the, the idea that, that, um, that, the measure of faith, um, going back to the humility and the recognition, the balance of, of keeping that all together, you know, that's, that's where we're meant, we're meant to be moving forward in, in our journey in faith, okay? Um, and then he goes on to give us a synopsis of what you can read in chapter um, um, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 12 about the body of Christ um, and it's the idea of that we have unity and diversity um, and and a part of this the reason that that for St. Paul this is such an important image is because and the Catholic Church embraces this and for back in the 70s and the 80s um, there was a period of time when, when, the theo when Catholic theologians were talking about there being an eighth sacrament and that being church that that we are and they kibosh the idea for a variety of reasons but we are meant to be the presence in the same way the presence of christ is in the eucharist in the same way the presence of christ is in the sacrament of baptism and confirmation and anointing of the sick the presence of christ is in the world because the church is in the world and so you know uh, this unity and diversity. Why is Paul calling us to live the way he's calling us to live? Is so that when people see the church, oh, look at those people at St. Edith. See how they love one another. I want to be a part of that. You know, um, here at St. Colette's, isn't that a, a wonderful, those, um, what wonderful things are they doing? Uh, you know, with the mat makers um, and the, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the yeah, I'm, uh, I'm blanking, um, all the things that they're doing there. You know, I want to be a part of that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm dissatisfied with my life. Maybe they have the answer. Our, our CIA program should be busting at the seams. And then we go on to verse seven or six and eight. Um, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. You know, let us use them. That's, you know, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, different gifts. Let's use them. Um, we've, you know, um, uh, okay. And then we get into um, a list of, uh, let's see. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. Having gifts that differ according to grace um, was given to us. And then, you know, prophecy. Let us prophesy according to the portion of our faith. Um, so when, when, when scholars believe that when St. Paul is talking about um, uh, according to the grace that has been given to us, what he, they believe that he is alluding to the deposit of faith. So there needs to be 
um, safeguards so that we do not go far afield. Um, uh, you know, there, um, without identifying any, any specific religion uh, specifically, we can probably all identify in, um, you know, these wacko religions, okay? Um, how about, let's just say cults, okay? Um, so we need to have parameters that, that help guide us. And, and, and Roger and I were talking about this earlier too in regards to how there are those individuals out there that, okay, they, um, they convert to, to, um, to belief in Jesus Christ. They read the Bible from beginning to end and now they feel that they are competent to, have, to start their own church, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and while they might have the fervor and, and the, um, the enthusiasm of their faith that will, will uh, uh, bring people to them, if there is no parameters within which to guide what they believe, then what is going to happen is that they are going to go far afield, or they could potentially go far afield. Okay? And so what is our deposit of faith? We have the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We have canon law. We have the rubrics, which are, are those um, liturgical documents that tell us how we are meant to pray. Um, I, so it, the, the, the idea, so when he says, um, you know, according to grace, over 2,000 years the Catholic Church has, has um, accepted the revelation, the, the, the individual leadings and revelations of God to lead us to, to have a strong foundation to guide us. That being said, what we continue to struggle with is that finding that balance between the word of God, meaning the truth of God, what God is leading us to, and black and white, these are the rules, you have to do it this way. That makes sense, and that will be a continual battle um, uh, until I'm sure until the end of time. That just because you know that that there there is a pastoral approach and there's a liturgical approach or um, a, the law. There is pastoral and the law, and they're meant to be like this, but sometimes they are like this. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and then, so talking about prophecy. Did anyone want to say anything about prophecy? Question? Concern? Yeah? No, I expected this to, whenever I expect something, it never happens. You know? I think people are to say about it. Okay. So what do you think, that, what do you think would be on some people's That's minds? Why. Way back in the Old Testament, right. prophecy, but not now. It doesn't happen now. If if people make a prophecy now, oh, they're crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. All people predict the end of the world, so it's there. So, do, that's does, why it's just oh, is it relevant? Is it is it going today? You know, right. So the so. Um, how many of you? Agree, well, no, I won't. You don't have to show it. Raise your hands, but they, I, I, um, I agree with you that, that that it is it is a difficult topic, especially as Catholics, for us to talk about, because so many Protestant religions um, base a lot of their faith on, well, I'm going to prophesy now. I've just I've just received from the from uh, a vision from God, and and next week we're all to wear greed. Okay, you must all, you know, and I'm being ridiculous here, but, but there, there is this uncomfortableness within religion because sometimes it can seem ridiculous. Um, and it, in truth, some of it is ridiculous. I, I remember Y2K. <laughs> One of my favorite memories of Y2K, um, I was an avid listener to 103.5, um, I can't think of the name of the, of the call letters of the station. But it was, it's a Christian radio station based here in, in Detroit. 
um, and um, Al Cresta, who, is, who was Catholic, baptized Catholic, um, uh, found Jesus during the Jesus, Jesus movement in the 60s and the 70s, became, uh, went through seminary, became a pastor, uh, became a radio talk show host, and, and hosted some excellent um, um, uh, people, books and stuff, which I listened to avidly because I was a stay-at-home mom, uh, and I could um, at that time. And, um, but then he, be then he became Catholic in his own personal studies, realized that the truth was in the Catholic Church. But on one of his programs, um, he hosted just before the, the we got to uh, January, or December 31st, this pastor who believed that um, the end of the world was going to be at midnight on December 31st. And so he and most of his congregation moved to Jerusalem or moved to the Middle East so that they could be there when Christ returned. And why it's my favorite memory is, as, so this is, just, this is Je December 31st, Alcresta is interviewing him over the phone, and at the end of the phone conversation he says to him, so, can I call you tomorrow? <laughs> and the gentleman said, sure, but I won't be here. He called him the next day, you know, because obviously the world didn't come to an end. Because personally, my, my thought is, hey, if, if God is going to follow any calendar, he's going to follow a religious calendar. The end of our liturgical year <laughs> happens just before Advent. You know, that's when it should have happened. But anyway, you know, it, it is, so in, what, when, what St. Paul is talking about here in terms of prophecy, is the idea that, that we have to think of prophecy as having um, two, two phases to it, okay? Prophecy still does happen today, but it is more of a personal revelation that is meant to lead the people rather than God tapping someone on the shoulder and saying, Alan, tell everybody to wear green <laughs> next Wednesday, you know? It, yeah, I don't know why I went into that, <laughs> that voice. The, the, um, through the Old Testament, John the Baptist, Jesus was the last voice of God in prophecy to the world. That makes sense? But when we are baptized, we are baptized to be sharers in Jesus' mission and ministry, to be priest meaning that we are called to leadership. We are called to um, be um, a, a, a royal, to be king, to be a part of a royal nation, children of God, and to be prophet. And so we, uh, and, and if you, if you um, want to tackle something that's a, a little bit more challenging and this interests you, um, I would recommend the book, um, uh, the Prophetic Imagination by Walter Bogelman, B-R-U-E-G-G-M-A-N. Um, Dr. Walter, yeah. He, um, he was a Harvard Old Testament scholar. And what he, he talked about is that, yes, did God tap people on the shoulders? Yes. But much of what a prophet did from, uh, throughout all of time and what we're called to do today is to know God so well that we can identify what God would want. So um, I would uh, you know, point to, while they did not come out of this because of their, their Christian belief, um, Greta Thurn, Thurnman, Thurnberg, um, that the Swedish girl um, who, who spoke out in terms of the environment. Um, I'm, I can, um, Malala Yousef, I think, yeah, that um, who spoke in, out in regards to the right of women in her area to be educated. Um, you know, um, one who did speak out in terms of, uh, because of his Christian belief, Martin Luther King Jr., you know, Mother Teresa, um, John Paul II, um, you know, 
we are, we, so yes, prophecy still does happen today. Um, and Paul is calling us to recognize that, that we're on a journey and, and you're embracing that journey by the, our studying together. But that journey is meant to be one that leads us to know God and know God's voice so well that in, in this moment we, we recognize that this is the right thing to do or this is the right way to become. Um, several years ago, I, I um, took a, um, gosh, I, and I'm going to forget the priest's name, um, but um, he, he did a workshop and he, that was his whole, he, what, that was basically the point of the, this like three day seminar was um, what our faith is leading us to today. And, and after many days of kind of setting up a foundation, he, the two that, he says there are many things, but the two things that we are, are called to, um, to really take seriously are, is the environment and um, the right to life. And when I'm not just talking abortion, I'm talking about quality of life and, and length of life and, and that all those two things are critical issues for especially us here in the United States. You know? That he was a prophet in, in that moment of speaking out. Yes? It was like the right to life group and their teaching on abortion and on the sacredness of life. Do you... Would they, are, that, they, that they are prophets? Yeah. Um, in their action, they're, they're following through with prophecy. Um, you know, uh, that, um, I, you know, I have to think about that. I don't, because I think there's a difference between um, like a Greta mm -hmm. and Malala who are, who are or a John Paul II who are saying things in such a public way and in some ways a, a, a first way um, as opposed to us then acting on that prophecy. Um, and and the, the, I, 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 I guess too, I, I wanna say that, there, that even in this period of time, there's a difference between public prophecy and private revelation. I don't feel that I necessarily am called to stand on a soapbox or to take such a public stance that the others would follow me. Um, but I do believe that that I recognize when God is calling me to, to understand something different than the way I've been living. Does that kind of make sense? So let me think about that. Uh, let me pray on that because I'll have to, um, it's a good point. Okay, we're gonna move on because we've got a ways to go. Um, okay, so um, just to cover those last ones, ministry and ministering, and he's talking here. So he's ta he's, he has talked about the body of Christ. So he's talking not in terms of general way. He's talking about how a church is meant to be church. So that you know, um, there is a way for those who have that responsibility of, of being the official administrators um, of, a, of, a, uh, of a church community, um, you know, teacher as, as in teaching, and, uh, you know, as such as, as in catechists. In the time of, of the first uh, century church, the primary and basically only catechesis that was going on was those adults who were converting to faith. And for, for centuries, children were catechized in the home, you know. It's only been within the last, I don't know, several hundred years that the idea of taking catechesis out of the home and having, giving it over to someone else um, was expected. Um, and so, you know, we were, you know, the idea of, because why in the home? Because it's a culture. It's creating a culture. Um, and, and that's what families need to do because, so anyway, um, exhorter, uh, in exhortation, what is an exhorter? It's someone who motivates. It's someone who, who um, uh, encourages. Uh, you know, we forget that sometimes that, that we, we need to pat each other on the back and saying, I know you're going through a hard time, but you know, hang in there. 
you're doing a good job. You know, thank you um, for for doing that. Um, I, I um, so those of you who are at St. Colette's um, know that I write two bulletin articles, um, weekly bulletin articles, and and while I love to write and I and I find it a very um, um, challenging and and life giving experience, it is a very silent. And as an extrovert, I like an audience because it helps me know that I'm I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. So there have been many people in the last many weeks of my life who have been exhorters to me because they've come up to me after mass and said, I love your articles. You know, that last one you wrote, oh, that was so good. And, and, it, and it's not that I, I really need to hear it, but it helps me know people are reading what I'm writing. You know, um, and, and so it gives me encouragement and it moves me forward. Um, giver. Uh, yes, can we give our time and our talent? Absolutely, but, but scholars believe that St. Paul here is specifically talking about financial help. Um, that, and, uh, that the idea, that, and why do they think that? Is because all of Paul's missionary life after um, when he started, he, he made three missionary trips. His trip to Rome would have been his fourth missionary trip. Why did he take those trips? It's because he was collecting money from these, these churches outside of Jerusalem to bring back to Jerusalem to help because they, they were under oppression there. And many of them didn't have work and jobs and they had widows and orphans. And, and so they needed the financial help to be able to maintain a quality of life in Jerusalem. And so that's why they believe that what St. Paul is saying here, it's not enough, just enough to give our time and our talent, but our finances are important as well. Um, uh, a leader in diligence. And again, going back to those official leaders of the church. Um, and then compassion in cheerfulness. And that's that something we can all be. We can be, all be the light of Christ to one another. <coughs> okay, comments, questions? Okay, so we are now going to move on to um, the last uh, verses, uh, 9 to 21. Let love be sincere. Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Anticipate one another in showing honor. Do not grow slack in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Endure in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the holy ones. Exercise hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Have the same regard for one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be concerned for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, on your part, live at peace with all. Beloved, do not look for revenge, but leave room for the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Yeah, I like that part of verse 20. You will heap coals upon their heads. Burning coals, yes. Comments, questions? Things, something that struck you. So, in this section, again, um, scholars believe that St. Paul is speaking in regards to relationships that we have within the church community. Um, uh, while, yes, can you extrapolate and take this to the larger world? Absolutely, and we should. But I find it interesting that, uh, that in his, 
um, um, own awareness uh, that he hasn't idealized, no, I shouldn't say it that way, that he, he probably has lived through much of what he's talking about in terms of just being in the church. You know, because we are called, as John so eloquently said earlier, you know, we are, we are a sinful people. And so, um, and I, I love a saint, uh, saint, Pope Francis's um, image that, that a church is not a community of saints. A church is a field hospital where we as sinners come together to be healed, you know. But we forget that sometimes, that, and, and the outside world uses it against us all the time, that, that we are a sinful people, and as such, um, yeah, are there some people that I would love to reap some vengeance on? <laughs> Someday I'm going to write my, 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 my own story um, as uh, a, one of the first lay women who worked for the Catholic Church. Not, you know, now I realize that a nun, a, a sister, a brother are considered lay people, but someone who is outside of a religious order, a woman, A, working in a completely male-dominated, but in a, a period of time of when they, this was all new, how do I deal with, with this woman? You know. So yes, I have had my experiences in life that, um, and someday I may write about it, who knows. Um, huh? I should? Huh? Okay, I have two buyers, anybody? <laughs> they can pass it around, yeah. Um, Yeah, give it to family as Christmas presents, yeah. Um, so what, what St. Paul is, is offering here is a, a yet a get an, another set of guidances to us work, what, working together um, as a Christian community. And, and so there, it's a series of moral maxims. Um, and his, in verse 9, we give, he has, again, his foundational statement. Let love be genuine. Now, there is truth to the, to the idea of fake it until you make it. That sometimes, you know, my mother once told me, and I, and I, I think there, there's a lot of truth to this, you don't have to like everybody, you gotta love them though, okay? So sometimes what we need to do is to treat others with love even though we're not feeling it, okay? Um, and then he goes, he goes on, um, Oh, you know, um, oh, excuse me, let me take a step back. Um, so the idea of love, whoops, go back. Um, it, uh, Second Corinthians 6, 6. We prove ourselves, so we prove ourselves to one another. We prove ourselves to the world by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. So this concept of loving one another, that, that is the most transformative element of our faith, not only for ourselves, but for one another. Um, one of the, the things that I used to love in terms of working with children, especially junior high and high school, was for kids to have a sense for the first time in their life that they belonged someplace, that they weren't, that even, in the rest of the world, they might be an outsider because they had, they had, you know, some somewhere they were somewhere on the the spectrum um, that they were they were outsiders because they they were considered nerds or whatever. But they came to this youth group or they came to this activity, and all of a sudden, people actually acted like they liked them and accepted them. You know, that's what, what church is meant to be, is a place where they, they find acceptance and, and, and love. Um, um, okay, and, then, and, and how do we love? And that's where he goes on. We, we do that um, 
we hate what is evil and we hold fast to what is good. Um, uh, and then he also gives a, another qualification and one that, that um, some people have found not necessarily easy to, to do. Love one another in sibling love, you know. Oh, yes, I'm loving, I'm loving my neighbor. Yes, I am. Boy, am I loving my neighbor. It's going to become the, the, the book I write is going to have that Fabio look on the front, you know. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's important to realize that, that, that we, there, that there are different shades of love and, and that, you know, a part, uh, and, and I, I don't mean to scandalize anyone here, but, you know, our sexual love is a part of love and that we all have a sense of physical attraction. And, and St. Paul is saying that's normal, but what we are called to in regards to our relationships with one another, um, especially if we are married, and even if we're not married, um, the idea of celibacy until marriage is meant to be the way we live our lives, okay? Um, okay. Um, and then you go in verse 11. Um, the idea of zeal, that the, uh, is enthusiasm. And, you know, I, I've, I've talked about this before in the past, um, but um, what word do you proclaim as a person of faith. When people see you and see you as a church lady or a church guy, do they see excitement? Do they see enthusiasm? Do they see passion? Or do they see boredom? Um, I love watch, uh, you know, the, I, I, I've noticed, I don't love, but I noticed how people walk into church. <laughs> this is their look when they're walking out. And could that be because they've been touched by the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But the cynic in me says it's probably because now I can do what I want to do. <laughs> you know? You know um, St. Paul is saying that, you know, we, this, is how, this is how we... Uh, it's, it, um, enthusiasm is contagious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When someone has a passion for something, doesn't it draw us into that? Um, and then he goes on, he says, uh, in, in my, um, my translation of the Bible, it says, um, in zeal, be aglow with the Spirit. I love that word, aglow, because that's how I feel when, when the Spirit has captured me. I feel a glow. Um, and, and then it says, serve the Lord. So, yes, does that mean... Um, our, by our participation and, and our, our, our investment and involvement in the ministries of the church? Absolutely. But what is the primary way we serve God? How do we serve God? An unseeing, untangible God. Serving one another. So we serve God by serving one another. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it, it becomes, when we, when we are community, it becomes not so much about ourselves, but about the other. How are you doing today? You know, it's so glad to see you. If people could get out of themselves when they came to church, or when they are church, I, I think we would be a much more happier church. And I realize that some people bring a very heavy load with them into church, and that's why they're at church. Uh, and, and we all need those seasons in our lives, or we all have those seasons in our lives. But when, but it becomes um, um, maybe a habit that we kind of maintain that somber, you know, feeling with one another. Um, okay, and then moving on to verse 12. And when, um, Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be consistent in prayer. These are three qualities 
that will help us transform ourselves and to maintain our, and nurture and maintain ourselves in this life of living faith with one another. You know, rejoice in hope. You know, be confident. Um, and what are we confident in? We are confident in the love of God. We are confident in the mercy of God. We are confident in the idea that salvation has been won for us and that we will know um, the glories of heaven if we continue to live in this, this life as we're living it. Be patient in suffering. Not an easy thing to do, and I understand that. Um, we all have, have our burdens that we must bear, um, you know, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, physically. But if we are patient, and, and, and how, do we, how are we patient? We recognize that, A, God did not send this into our lives. There is, we've talked about the, the specific will of God. And it's not the word, I can't remember it now, but the, the, um, um, the will of God that allows things to happen because of, of respect and honoring free will. And so, okay, I've gone through a very difficult year, um, not as difficult as most, but it's been, I've had my own issues, and I, it, you know, I, I tried, and I did not blame it on God, but there were times when I was very angry that I didn't have a better quality of life. And... Um, you know, the idea of being patient is, is, you know, recognizing that God didn't will this, but in this happening, and this is when I was able to get into a better frame of mind, is that I can take the suffering that I am going through and unite it with the suffering of Christ. In the same way that we are united in, with Christ through baptism, in priest, prophet, and king, we are united in Christ with his suffering as well. And that my suffering, remember back in the day when people would say to us, offer it up, yeah. okay? I, in offering my suffering up, I join in Christ's redemption of the world. I, you know, in the same way I can, I can pray for others at home, my prayer becomes, Lord, let, I will endure, I will gladly endure what I am enduring knowing that that in the same way you're enduring the pain on the cross brought about the redemption of the world. So, you know, it's, it's that offering it up idea. Yes, Paul. I was going to say, uh, there's another aspect of that tool with the suffering. When I was in the hospital, there was a minister that came through, and he said, um, don't worry about your suffering. You're helping other people by having them serve you. That's, I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, and, and it's hard for us, as, especially, as, you know, in our independent natures. I can do this myself. It, it's hard to let others take care of us. And, and but that's, that is, that's another, that's a part of the redemption, the redemptive nature of suffering is that we do allow others to take care of us. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, um, and perseverance in prayer, and that that the idea that we that um, we pray not only in the good times or not only when we want something, but we pray continuously, um, every day, and um, in and in, in a variety of ways. I don't, and I'm going to just move on because I'm aware of the time. Uh, verse thirteen. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Um, practice hospitality. Um, he's talking once again about a financial support. Um, I, 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 I'm surprised he doesn't, you know, if it was modern times, he'd say, so put more money in your envelope. <laughs> um, practice hospitality. Um, you know, it's the idea that of extending yourselves, opening your homes, not only to um, those within the community, but to strangers as well, you know. Um, and then um, we, in verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless, uh, bless and do not curse them. What does that sound like? 
who said, who, who said something similar? But Jesus said, I say unto you, love your enemies, be good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which dis, dis, um, despitefully use you. You know, so it, again, and, and again, he's talking primarily about what happens within the community. So the next time, you know, you're on this committee and, um, and, and you have tension with someone, one of the other leaders in the community, and, and when the event is over, the, that person thanks everybody but you. <laughs> you know, rather than, as we're going to talk about, seeking vengeance. Okay. Um, and then 15 and 16, this whole idea of, of um, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with an, one another, you know, humility. Um, you know, it, it, we've kind of, we've already talked about that, but it's the idea of sharing, of in, investing yourself in the lives of other people. Um, and then when it says, um, the whole, the, the last part, associate with the lowly. So St. Paul is coming out of an attitude or a culture where the established ranking of individuals is very important, okay? Um, those who were rich did not associate with the lowly. Um, the, and, and that would get, tran that, that culture would be tran transmitted or um, take, be taken into every aspect of life. So even within the, the Christian community, um, the rich did not associate with the lowly, okay? And so he, he's challenging that. This is how you are community, is that there is no lowly. We're all lowly. In one way, we're all sinners. And so we, we need to, just because you don't, the, um, we, there was a gentleman, I worked at St. Thomas the Apostle in Ann Arbor, and we had a, ge a gentleman, his name was Henry, and he, he had some uh, mental and physical disabilities. I, and, you know, but he was an adult. And in his disabilities, he, he rarely shaved, he rarely bathed, he basically wore the same clothes um, day after day after day. So you can imagine, um, and he would, but he was at, was at church every Sunday. And he was at every social event that we had. Part of the reason is that Henry didn't have a lot of money and there was food. So, but he was difficult to be around. And um, what St. Paul is saying, don't avoid him. You know, reach out to him. Make him feel like he's a part of the community. Um, okay, 15 and 16. Uh, again, our relationship with our brothers and sisters, it says in, um, you know, um, uh, repay no one evil for evil. Take thought for what is uh, noble in the sight of all. You know, how are we treating one another? Uh, and we've kind of already talked about that. Rejoice with those who rejoice with the Lord. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Be humble, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. And I'm, I, I, I put, yeah. One of my great frustrations as a teacher, especially working with adults, is that a lot of, the, of my time in RCIA was spent reteaching people the truth of our faith. Because whether by, through innocent misunderstanding or by intention, um, people have been taught a lot of wrong things about what it means to be Catholic. Um, so don't make it up. If you do not know what when someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer, don't make it up. Say, I'll find out and I'll get back with you. Okay. All right. Um, that was a personal pet peeve of mine. Could you tell? Uh, and so in these last, um, you know, the making a bit of a transition, he's still talking about our, our living within the church, our relationships, with, but also how we treat the outside world. Do not repay one evil f for evil, um, uh, but take thought to what is noble. Um, uh, beloved, never avenge art yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. So what is, what, 
St. Paul is not saying to us the idea, okay, to step back and, and in humility say, I'm not going to worry about the fact that I was not mentioned in that list of volunteers because I know God's going to get her. <laughs> what St. Paul is saying is that we are to be comforted that God knows all, sees all, and will be better able in justice and love to deal with the wrong that was done. If it was up to me, I would publicly, publicly humiliate her. You know, and I'd put her in stocks and I'd throw rotten tomatoes at her. Far beyond what the error called, called for. Um, so it, the, what St. Paul is saying in that is that we are to trust in the mercy of God and, and believe that God, that all wrongdoing is under the purview of God who will take care of it. Make sense? Um, okay. Last words, comments? Okay. Yes, ma'am. You know, it struck me on verse 14 when it says, Bless those who persecute you. I, I thought back to Good Friday, and I was a divine child, and they did the seven last words of Christ, and one of them is just, Father, forgive them. Yes. The, so, yes, the, um, if you ever get the opportunity, St. Colette done, has done it twice, um, the, the last, uh, last seven words of Christ. Beautiful, beautiful meditation, um, powerful music. Um, it's a, a blending of scripture and, and choral and solos. Um, but it, it, the, the idea that we are, if we were to emulate Christ, what did Christ do? On the cross, at, at the peak of his suffering, turns not to spit at everybody, but to say, Lord, forgive them. Yeah. And I think on those words, we're going to end. Okay? And, oh, no, I guess not, Paul. <laughs> Okay. So it uh, on Netflix. What is it called? Moses the Prophet. Moses the Prophet. Okay. It's a series. Yeah, it's, I think I think it's like three or four. It's not very bad. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, any last announcements? Then let us pray. Um, and I'd like to um, begin by praying in gratitude for our community of faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord and what else shall we pray for? That my grandson will get a job. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. And for those prayers that rest deep within our hearts, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, you are a God that is so awesome. We can barely fathom or understand the goodness that you are. We continue to give you praise and thanksgiving for St. Paul and his writings, his teachings. We ask, Lord, that as we leave here today, that we will reflect on this chapter and how we are, what those areas that we have embraced and are, um, we continue to need to fortify and those areas that maybe we need to work a little harder on. Give us strength in our faith. Give us courage in our faith. Give us love. These things we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.
And we acknowledge that you are God and we are not by saying glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And we end as we began in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.